Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Test Tubes and Cauldrons, a podcast where we talk about the science behind spirituality. Welcome back. This is our first episode of the second season, so thank you so much for sticking around while we took a brief break. In case you don't know who we are and you have not listened to any of our previous episodes, I am Astra, a ceremonial magician, primarily a planetary magic practitioner, and then also a biochemist in real life. Hello, um, I'm Hannie. I'm also a biochemist, well turned microbiologist. I'm also a Hellenistic practitioner, and I have some interest in herbalism and various other things. Hi, I'm I'm Felicity or Fell. Most people call me Fell, I think, on, on these here parts. <laughs> I am a Hellenic polytheist, and I mostly do history stuff. I work in historical education, and I also do like eight million like like historical music and historical sewing. That's me. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good introduction to myself. <laughs> You covered all of it. <laughs> yeah. I like fully forgot the word polytheist there in the introduction. So it's going well so far for season two, Mercury Retrograde. This is what we get for recording the first episode back oh, on no. the first day of Mercury Retrograde. Go us. We are going to dive back into the podcast with the second part of one of our series called Science and Occultism Through the Ages. So previously in the first season, we had an episode where we talked about the classical era, and we decided we would come back and talk about the medieval era, talk about the differences between how science was viewed in both eras, how it developed, and then possibly going into what it would develop into in the future. But before we get into that, we're going to do our What Happened on This Day segment. Who wants to do that? Because I didn't look at any of these. Okay, today, September the 27th, marks the death of William Hume Rothery. William was a, a British metallurgist internationally known for his work on the formation of alloys and intermetallic compounds. He established that the microstructure of an alloy depends on the different sizes of the component atoms, the valency electron concentration, and electrochemical differences. Hume Rothery rules are an empirical guide to when two metals are sufficiently similar to be completely miscible. Is that correct? <laughs> miscible. Missable, whatever. I think I'm thinking about mushrooms, my little symbol or whatever. <laughs> Here are the rules. Atomic radii, no more than about 15% different. Two, pure metals have the same crystal structure. Three, atoms have similar electronegatives. And four, atoms have the same balance. And I think this kind of uh, ties in actually quite a bit to the, some of the things that we're going to touch on in this, especially related to metallurgy. It ties in very well to some alchemy stuff I will talk about later. Let's get into it. But first, we're going to do what we usually do, which is defining the time period that we are talking about. So what do we mean when we say the medieval period? And then what kind of specific years will we be focusing on for this episode? Defining the Middle Ages is controversial, especially since, you know, when you say Middle Ages or medieval, it's primarily people are referring to like, a Western European point of view, specifically. Definitions span from like literally the collapse of the Roman Empire, which is the late fifth century, to the beginning of the early modern period in the early 15th century. So some people will shorten it by saying like 1100 and then ending like around 1300. Essentially, it's the, it's the time period between antiquity, which would be the Roman period, the Roman Empire, um, or all the things before a leading up to the Roman Empire, and then the Renaissance, which is why it's the Middle Ages. I want to be clear here, we're not talking about the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a lot of times what people think of when they're actually, but they're like, say, medieval. So the dates that we kind of arbitrarily set, uh, arbitrarily enough, <laughs> like, it's all arbitrary, right? Because the Renaissance started at different times, also, depending on where you are. But we're generally going with around 600 to 1300 AD. The 14th century, to me, is quite a bit pushing it in the Middle Ages. I usually consider that the beginning of the Renaissance, but that's neither here nor there. So we're not talking about the Renaissance. We're talking 600 to around 1300. A lot of common misconceptions surrounding this era. Fell already covered some of them, so that's uh, including the Renaissance in the medieval period. Um, another one is referring to the medieval period as the Dark Ages, 
And this is a really common one. It's owing to the perceived lack of scientific discovery and also artistic development during this time, which is just not true, as we'll kind of get to. But this time period is kind of typified especially by the dominance of the Catholic Church, which presided over many facets of daily life. There are many scientists that were killed by the Catholic Church. So that includes people like Roger Bacon, uh, Ceccio di Ascoli, and Pietro di Abano. Apologies to all Italians listening. And we're going to return to this later. But the fact that we had lots of scientists killed led to this thing called the conflict hypothesis or conflict thesis, which is this idea that science and the Catholic Church were inherently opposed to one another and the church was anti-science. But this isn't true because although the church did execute these people, there was also a lot of scientific development coming from within the church itself. The evidence suggests that these individuals were executed for heresy associated with their theological beliefs. So De Bano, for example, associated with, with planetary magic, and De Soli had some demological views. That being said, there were some genuine difficulties that precluded scientific development in the Western Europe, and particularly the fact that a lot of scientific texts from antiquity were written in Greek or Latin. The literacy rate in the population in Western Europe was around 20% or less, and even fewer people could read Greek or Latin. So this basically constrained scientific development in Western Europe to learned elites, and especially clergymen who had the education and the time to access that knowledge. But over time, during the medieval period, the rediscovery of these texts and the development of medieval universities around 1000 AD was a key factor in reinvigorating medieval science. Um, We also saw a lot of developments in the Byzantine Empire around this time in the Islamic Golden Age, which we'll talk about later. And so this this kind of sharing of ideas between scholars and theologians allowed developments to make their way across Europe. Thel, do you want to give us maybe like more of an idea of like how religion played a role in this time period Um, or maybe to the extent at which it played a role? that we kind of know with the like the framework that we're thinking about i mean i feel like honestly just saying that the the catholic church dominated it it is pretty much most of what you're really going to need to know a lot of the weird funky religious history doesn't come until the renaissance a lot of places were still getting christianized at this time like pretty much according to the scale that we've set the time period that we've set scandinavia wasn't christianized until the later middle ages So there were quite a number of pagans and pagan influences. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the charms. And some of them are just like straight up pagans. But what's interesting about them is they were only allowed to be performed by clergy, even though they call upon like a harvest goddess, which is weird and wild. Christianity, specifically Catholicism, was definitely like the dominant But there were some funky things going on. Like you get some weird saints, like St. Ginnifort, who's a dog. So there is kind of like, yeah, it was, that's a fun one. You should look that up. Anyone listening at home, St. Kinnaford. So there was a lot of like fast and loose happening. A lot of who's canon, who's not, who has the say, who doesn't. So that kind of conflict going on. Like we don't have a lot of secular music from this time period because it wasn't allowed to be written down. So that tends to dominate or color a lot of our written texts that we have. So during our last episode in the series, we focused on the classical era in ancient Greece. And this was a time where the pursuit of knowledge was kind of apparently flourishing, but it was largely under the guise of philosophy rather than what we'd strictly call science. So during this period, science was more observational than adhering to the formalized method we have today. We had things like um, Theophrastus' study on plants, lots of kind of observational things on the properties of plants and uh, the natural world. But this method, kind of the scientific method, began to develop in the medieval period, and it was in its infancy during this time. A lot of theologians and monks monks pursued scholasticism, which is a sort of a philosophy, sort of a method of thinking, which promoted a rigorous dialectical critique of ideas. So it kind of comes from Aristotelian logic originally, and it kind of attempted to reconcile traditional Christian theology with philosophy that was being recovered and translated by monks at the time. So Aristotelian logic, also Neoplatonist ideas, they were trying to reconcile these two schools of thought. And this approach was taught in medieval universities and expounded on by figures like Thomas Aquinas. And this kind of aimed to formulate and dissect statements, and particularly those of a theological nature. So it was almost treating theology in a semi-scientific way. And this kind of systematized critique was arguably one of the first steps towards hypothesis formation, which is obviously really important in science. We also had figures like Roger Bacon. He was a cleric, a scholar on optics, and also potentially a wizard, although accounts vary. Um, But he represents one of the earliest advocates for a true scientific method. Notably, he translated some of Aristotle's works on optics and tried to replicate them using an empirical approach. And this is key because previously empirical measurement hadn't really been undertaken that much. And he borrowed this approach from a famed um, Arabic physicist called Ibn al-Haytham. 
And then finally, um, one of his teachers, Robert Grossetus, he was a cleric who was nearly canonized as a saint, apparently. And he was another scholastic who was involved in the translation of these works. And he called for kind of experimentation to validate these prior ideas. So we've got these kind of three things going. We've got hypothesis formation, empiricism, and experimentation. They're very slowly making their way in. And although there were way more scholars than this who were kind of developing these things, I think these three kind of exemplify the developing trends towards a more scientific understanding of the world. But it was definitely one that was harmonious with religion because these people were largely involved with the church. Yeah, so a question I think we can pose from this is whether you think this is when the occult really became occult in the sense of of studying that which is hidden maybe not really with the idea that we've discussed previously of like mystery cults but the idea that things that were considered a cult maybe now were were heresy at the time this question made me think a lot because i think there's some credence to this idea because as you mentioned the church at the time although it welcomed the study of math of mathematics philosophy science and, and other topics it was all within kind of this flavor of their religion so there is very much so an idea of like science was a way to study the physical realm and that in essence helped us understand more about God and the creator. And anything that didn't fit that framework was shunned. And this is kind of may, I won't say did, may have been the start of the occult being labeled as something else. So for example, being called the philosophy of nature, as Roger Bacon actually put it. And it was done in this way to be more agreeable for the religious standards at the time and to make it seem maybe less esoteric and something that fits more within this Christian and um, Catholic framework. What do you all think? Yeah, it's like a weird kind of paradox because it seems like the metaphysical and scientific ideas were like super, super, super entwined during this time. So there were, there were lots of ideas which... God was inherent to a lot of the scientific paradigms at the time. But the metaphysical was only kind of within the theological bounds set by the church. But I think it's maybe important to note that there was active discussion within the church about what was kind of valid doctrine. And there were people who were interested in the study of things like demons, which then later, like much later, kind of Renaissance time, got translated into kind of demonological works. So it wasn't like there was one singular law and that was followed. There was there was active discussion within the church. But yeah, like you say, there's certainly heresy drove a lot of stuff underground. And you could argue that the way that information was coded in certain places was also as a result of the pursuit of heresy. I'm kind of curious what you have to think about this as well, Fel, because my historical knowledge is probably quite limited. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard. I mean, because like we were kind of saying that like a lot of every, every single one of our, not every single one, but the majority of our surviving sources are from Catholic Church or from the bounds of the Catholic Church. And there was definitely like, I mean, we're going to get into the Islamic Golden Age, but like that was also like a, a massively, massively like influential period in history um, in which we can see some remnants of ideas that we might not have records of normally later, several hundred years later, but I still think it could be relevant of like Galileo. <laughs> um, and like all of that so, and like, all, all of those classic examples that people give of them being like opposed but also all of the like developments happened under the same sort of regime i will say that if you are curious about like christian mysticism this is really the time period to look into because this is where we see such a an interesting dissonance but at the same time collaboration between the idea that like mysticism support or science can support the mysticism of the Catholic and Christian Christian ideas based on this thought that like God and science essentially confirm quote unquote each other in many ways. And that studying, as I said, the natural realm is a way of like learning more about divinity, God, or, you know, spiritual realm and all of that. Yeah. Okay. So next on the list is the Islamic golden age. So, speaking of the Islamic Golden Age, uh, although Western Europe seems to get all the love when we discuss the medieval period, we can't talk about medieval science and occultism without the mention of the Islamic Golden Age. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, many Latin and Greek texts were retained and translated quickly by the Byzantines. Read things that some things that were lost in Alexandria survived because they were copied over over by the Byzantines. This would give the Arabic world like a head start of sorts and allowed all the sorts of forays into optics, astronomy, metallurgy, and alchemy. By contrast, scholars were largely segregated into monasteries in the early medieval period, which limited knowledge development early on. 
This somewhat subsided with the development of medieval universities like Paris and Oxford, as well as the travel of Byzantine scholars. So those whose ideas were reignited scientific development in Western Europe. I believe there's some like evidence to suggest some like cross-pollination of universities in which like people who were not able to study in Europe would study, like learn Arabic um, and go learn and then bring it back with them. In the medieval period, alchemy really began to see a revival, not quite as strongly as we will see in the Renaissance, um, which is really where we saw like a very big boom of alchemy being reintroduced into the popular space. But it certainly began, I think, in the medieval period, more in tune with what it was like in the classical era. So I do want to make a brief note, which is that Chinese, Indian, and Tibetan alchemy also had huge influences on alchemical ideas in Europe during the medieval time, but I don't go into the details here for the sake of time. However, I encourage you, if you're interested, to look into the history of alchemy if you are curious. I and mean, even if you're not curious, it's just really very fascinating writing. When the Arabs engaged in their conquest of Asia, they were known for not destroying the culture and philosophies that they found, but they rather treated them with interest and respect. And this actually often led to the incorporation of these beliefs and traditions into their own. And after the destruction of the Library of Alexandria, alchemical texts and knowledge were preserved by the Arabs, who then also expanded upon it. The Arabs, however, had a practical interest in alchemy, and they used it more to develop cures based upon a simplified version of humors, which is something that we've touched upon previously in other episodes. And this experimentation actually led to a collection of mineral remedies, which ironically eventually led to the discovery of mineral acids. Turns out when you mix things together that you don't know what they'll do, you can get some pretty nasty results. And I, though I won't get into them here, we've mentioned a couple of them earlier, but Jabir, Hajan, Al Hassan, Al Nakid, Al Masili, both are two Arab alchemists who came up with very popular alchemical theories that we still see today and wrote extensive treaties on the alchem on these theories and um, certain alchemical formulations. As we've alluded to previously, Christian scholars became increasingly interested in science and, and philosophy from the Greeks and the, and the Arabs, which led them to the study of alchemy. And this was popular, popularized by a couple of books published by some Arabs some Arab alchemists. These books included a very interesting, actually, mixture of both what we call esoteric and then exoteric discussions of alchemy. So both the mystic side of alchemy and then also the practical aspect. Based on these, other scholars began to experiment. Roger Bacon was an influential alchemist of this time period, and he had a, a reputation for trying pretty much any and all experiments related to hidden alchemical secrets. There was really nothing that he wouldn't attempt. And despite the church's interest in science at the time, Bacon's experimentation was not looked upon super kindly, despite his defense that alchemy was what he considered to be more of a serious science based upon, quote unquote, the philosophy of nature, rather than a representation of mystic and occult ideas. He produced hundreds of works on the topics of alchemy, astronomy, and a combination of esoteric philosophy with scientific logic. But despite that, Bacon was eventually imprisoned. Um, some say it was house arrest. That's not super clear. And then died um, shortly after. And if we move forward into the 13th and 14th centuries, 14th centuries, we're getting a little bit closer to the Renaissance era, um, so keep that in mind. But alchemy began to be included in encyclopedias and other books that were circulating through scholar hands. And ironically, actually, it was thanks to the more widespread study of alchemy by people who lacked the keys, I guess you could say, to understand the formulations used in these books that the return to this idea of alchemy being used as a profit, so the transmutation of metals, became the, the primary goal. It's interesting because if you look at the history of alchemy, it's definitely, it, it changes as you move forward. So transmutation of metals has always been kind of a key component, but there have always been other aspects, typically something around healing or trying to separate, purify, and then reconstitute elements to generate a particular effect. In the classical era, we saw this with a much more mystic element to it. But as we go into the medieval period and also the Renaissance era, this mystic element is kind of removed from it, it's especially in the medieval period. Moving into the Renaissance, we begin to see alchemy as a way to make money. This, as you can imagine, was very frowned upon by the clergy and actually led to Pope John the... I believe it was the 22nd, <laughs> who issued a law prohibiting counterfeit. So essentially what would happen is you would have alchemists who are claiming that they're transmuting base metals into gold or silver and then selling that to the highest bidder when in fact it was actually counterfeit. 
It was also out of the medieval period that the corpuscular theory and a new theory of transmutation arose. We don't really know who to give the credit to these two. There's a bunch of conflicting opinions. The idea behind the corpuscular theory specifically is that the substance is that all substances consist of these corpuscles. I can't English today, so apologies for mispronunciations. And they all they all are all different size. And if you have different sizes, it makes your compound impure. And when it's impure, it's not ready for transmutation until they're all the same size, thus free of impurity. And this is actually partially what led to the practice of separating what we consider now the salt, sulfury, and mercury of matter to purify it and then recombine it to give you the purest form. I thought it was really interesting and my understanding of alchemy is like extremely poor so uh, please forgive if, if this is incorrect but when I was looking up the Arabic influence on alchemy it seemed like there was a transition from using like biological materials so like eggs and blood and hair which was maybe partly more mystical to then using just like pure metals. So part of that apparently was because they used to, so, so in the Arabic alchemy world, there was distillation of some kind of ammonia material from those, from those. so you, could, you didn't have to use the biological materials, but they were kind of increasingly viewed as a corrupter. And I just wonder if that's part of that transition from like a mystical practice to something to make money, moving away from like the life-giving things that maybe would be associated with sort of philosopher's stone stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm making no sense here. <laughs> no, it's that's that's definitely true. So mercury is considered something that was was a part of all things, and so the idea was that if you were able to, you could add mercury to something to like make it more pure, if you would, and like realistically speaking, natural and organic materials were kind of a like impurity within the alchemical process because you needed your base metal to be pure. And what would prevent a base metal from being pure is if it had like dirt or like any kind of organic material that would impact its ability to be transmutated. So the use of organic material in Arab Arab alchemy is not super common, although it wasn't necessarily completely void because there were still herbal remedies and stuff that they that they made for healing. But it was definitely within the Arab kind of time period in alchemy that we also began to see mineral healing, which wasn't always good. Actually, it led to a lot of like metal medicines being made that ended up killing people. But it was it was an interesting idea and it did lead to some very common alchemical concepts that we see that we see today so then i'm kind of moving off of that i want to stem into medicine and um, something called leech books which we'll get into a little bit later but during this time i'm talking approximately 9th century moving forward the practice of medicine was still heavily rooted in the greek tradition of the four humors so the humors are controlled by the four elements and an imbalance of the humors is what caused disease and then any cures included purging the body of, of the excess humor to then bring everything back into harmony, right? Interestingly enough, though, this was rather fitting for a time period that's so fascinated and enthralled by astrology. There was also a strong belief that the moon and other planets played a role in good health. So they believed that the human body and planets were made of the same four elements. Of course, we know this isn't now true, um, and it's actually vastly more complex. For the body to operate well, there could be no imbalances. They believed that the moon had the greatest influence of, the, of fluids on Earth, thus had the strongest effect on the four elements in the body, which is why at the time, ironically, <laughs> the symbol of the doctor was actually a bottle of urine. So because... That's essentially how they diagnosed people. They would look at the urine and then based on what they saw, they would determine what was kind of out of balance. What's so interesting about that is then the cure that they proposed after the diagnosis was reliant upon astrological timing. This was one of the uses for um, one of the devices that came out of the medieval period, which was the astro... How do you even pronounce this? Astrolab? I think that's how you say it. (laughs) Which allowed astronomers to very accurately actually track the movements and placements of the planets or other celestial kind of beings in the sky at the time. The time at which they would perform some kind of cure procedure for this diagnosis was entirely based on the astrological timing, both off of a person's chart or just off of kind of a more general general timing. Yes. And actually, so this is an interesting aside that I kind of connected as I was looking into all of this. But I thought it was interesting, this idea that the moon had the greatest influence on fluids on Earth, 
because one could actually see some similarities of this on the Kabbalistic tree of life, with Yasad, the Sephiroth uh, ruled by the moon, being the closest to Malkuth, or the physical realm, which is ruled by the four elements. I don't know if that was a connection made by people in that time period, but it's one that I made outside of it. So just food for thought. I thought that medicine in the medieval era was like something that we could probably do an entire podcast on. Like it's so, 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 so fascinating. And there's loads and loads of um, interesting stuff here, but I'm going to try and keep it brief in the interest of time. Um, but putting aside the highly contagious plague that devastated huge swathes of the population at the time, uh, sounds very familiar, um, the medicine in the medieval period was actually more advanced than you might think. It was also quite entwined with occult practices, really more folk practices, and also Christian spiritual ideas, because a lot of the healers at the time would have been clergymen. So herbalism had developed in communities amongst folk practitioners. Most of them wouldn't have had access to earlier texts like Pliny's Natural History or Theophrastus's in- Inquiry into Plants, um, because obviously, as we mentioned, there was the issue of translation. But there were efforts to systematize knowledge. So these came in two main forms, and these were through the clergy themselves or through leech books. And I wondered, Phil, if you wanted to sidebar into Hildegard of, of Bingen, uh, who is is just wonderful and maybe worth mentioning because her herbalism was um, quite instrumental at the time. I'm not sure if you um, prepared or not. I, I love Hildegard for her music, too. So I actually, for like a while, didn't know that she... I, like I find when I meet people who love Hildegard, they either love her for her herbalism or they love her for her music. And like I didn't realize that she was both. I, I, I'm actually not... Pre- like prepped to talk about her herbalism but I I, she definitely was like the I mean incredible so Hildegard von Bingen for those who don't know who was like a nun and uh, she is just absolutely incredible wrote some real bangers let me tell you yeah, so she systematized a lot of knowledge, a lot of a lot of folk knowledge, and also I think she had the advantage of being in the clergy as well. So she was able to take both the kind of scholarly knowledge and the folk knowledge and put it all together. Um, and so a lot of our knowledge of of medieval cures at the time came from her. But yeah, just really, really fascinating, fantastic stuff that was kind of propagated as well by by clergymen across the time. And it's interesting, I think, too, because a lot of the time we we think about clergy and we think about men doing science like may and often we sort of neglect the contributions of women in science at the time but there were lots of female healers lots of them would be midwives and I mean she was one of these people she contributed a lot by systematizing the the, the knowledge and passing it along so just a really really important figure um but anyway, sidebar on Hildegard uh, aside, the other source um, where knowledge was sort of systematized was through leech books. So a leech was a medical practitioner who would be somewhere kind of between a folk healer and a qualified physician. And they wrote these books called leech books, which you can find online with beautiful illustrations that have been digitized. And they have compendiums of rem- remedies that are commonly used at the time. So some of them are of questionable merit um, and other ones are actually pretty interesting so I've picked out a couple which I thought would be interesting to discuss um, there's one in Bald's Leech Book which is from the 10th century it's um, an English uh, English leech book and it lists an eye salve for an eye infection so the salve is as followed take crop leek and garlic of both equal quantities pound them well together take wine and a bullock's gall I'm not quite sure what that is. I think it might be a testicle, but I'm not sure. Um, of both equal quantities, mix with the leek, put then into a brazen vessel, let it stand nine days in the brass vessel, wring out through a cloth and clear it well. Put it into a horn and about night time, apply it with a feather to the eye. So obviously there are some aspects of that which are really, really, really bad idea. Don't put feathers in your eyes because feathers can carry chlamydia cutesi and you can get really nasty eye infection. That being said, some scientists at the University of Nottingham decided to try out a cure, this cure, against three common bacterial agents that are responsible for eye infections. So this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staph aureus, otherwise MRSA, and Staph epididymis. And so they tried this cure. I don't think that they included the testicle, but I would have to read the methods. Um, and they tried it on both synthetic wounds and also wounds on mice. And they found, interestingly, that the salve worked to reduce the bacterial load. But I think the really interesting part is that the ingredients just by themselves did not. It was the combined effect of the, um, of the ingredients. So there is definitely something to it, um, which I thought was fascinating. Um, another one I found was to take a live snail and rub it against a burn, and the burn will heal. 
Um, and actually, this, this does have some merit. There are quite a lot of dermatological studies that suggest that snail mucin is beneficial to wound healing um, because it has antioxidant enzyme superoxide dismutasin, as well as its ability to promote collagen formation, which is obviously essential to your skin formation, and uh, promote cell migration, so the wounds heal more quickly. And snail mucin is actually commonly used in skincare. So although some folk remedies were, I guess we can say nonsense, <laughs> um, some of them were more based in superstition than anything else, a lot of them had genuine scientific merit and they really just came from experimentation. I'm curious if you guys know any other interesting folk remedies from the time. To give you an idea of some of the ridiculous notions um, also found within some of these leech books, specifically Bob's leech book, if someone had a tendency to overdrink himself or get drunk, the leech book suggested to take a swig of an infusion of uh, betony leaves before his next drink, or if all else failed, to try eating five slices of a roasted pig's lung in the evening. Not all the most maybe scientifically backed data or information, but still fascinating all the same. Paganism and heresy, my favorite topics. Okay, so while we've talked, you know, a lot about the church and Catholicism specifically, that wasn't the only religious view, and occultism did flourish during this time period, just potentially at the peril of those who challenged theological doctrine. Heretics were frequently pursued and burned at the stake for their views, owing to the association with the devil. This included numerous free thinkers at the time, such as Pietro de Bono. De Bono, an astrologer and professor of medicine in 11th century Italy, was a true polymath, studying toxicology, physics, medicine, and philosophy. He was keen to uh, systematize scientific knowledge, and crucially, he believed occultism to be a key part of this. De Bono believed that alchemy was essential to the understanding of medicine, and his cosmology echoed the understanding of the celestial spheres affecting the human body that Astra previously explained. De Bono was known to participate in div divination, such as palmistry and geomancy, and was thought to have written a book on angelic conjuration named the Heptameron. These trespasses against the church were too much to bear, and for these views, De Bono was brought before the Inquisition in 1316 and executed. So, well, like, definitely heresy, etc., was obviously bad and usually got you killed. I will point out there was no systematic witch hunts of the Middle Ages. There were some ground treaties against heresy where some of the ground, like some of the groundwork for the, the witch trials that then would later happen. And as I mentioned, there is a charm, a fun charm called the Acer Bot, which is an Anglo-Saxon charm recorded around the 11th century. It's like a, a weird prayer that this was a day long that began at night where you would take a bunch of dirt from the the field and then you created a poultice with yeast honey oil and milk and then it was later taken to the field again the small cross and then a prayer was said and it's funny if you read this prayer because it, it talks about mother of earth pagan structure but it had to be done by a priest and it was also like use certain Christian elements. And one thing that happens, and we'll probably touch upon this when we get into the Renaissance and Elizabethan. But one thing to note is that like the clergy is a lot of the early like Western occultism was stuff that was done by the clergy. So it wasn't like there was this extreme animosity between occultism and the church. It was almost more like they, they were more upset by Christian heresy. If you were like, I think God is actually two people, then, oh, God, we got to kill you. But, oh, okay, like, everyone did divination. Like, divination, like, Puritans did divination. Divination and other things like that were, were very common during this time period. Another fun thing is, is music. We talked a little bit, uh, or quite a bit about this, actually, in our frequencies episode so i won't like get into the whole shebang here but at this time period we had this is when we get the neve the emmanuel which is part of actually like a, a almost a, an, a magical refrain it's called what is it arrow it's i know that it spells out tomorrow i will be there it spells out this kind of phrase the the song titles when they're organized in a specific way. A lot of Gregorian chants at this time period were kind of magical. They would never have called it magical, but they definitely used frequencies to create some sort of divine experience. 
So that kind of straddled the line too, I would say, between the occult science and the church. I feel like the occult science and the church would be a great like book title. It'd be interesting for sure because yeah. it, they are like, especially in this time period, I think they're so intertwined, like more than any other time period. It would be fascinating to actually. So I'm I'm reading the Picatrix right now with a with a friend of mine. We're going through it together, and this this kind of intersection of all of these things together it's it's very obvious when you read the picatrix it was written kind of not necessarily i think exactly during this time period but but relatively close within because you see a lot of these ideas and kind of common themes pop up within that text and it's just so fascinating to me when i was researching for this episode i was like wow i see a lot of like similarities between what i'm currently reading and what i'm like researching today i feel like the intersection is stronger during this time period than perhaps in the other what i find really interesting is uh, probably because a lot of the stuff we have is written down by monks from the time but a lot of the things like folk remedies were kind of Christianized in order to stop them from being heresy because everything had to be explained by kind of the glory of God rather than some kind of superstitious or occult meaning. So you had kind of previous herbalist charms that were being, they were kind of rewritten or reused. And it was, there were kind of flimsy excuses found, which were sort of uh, heavily Christianized. So cedar might have been used for purification, but now it was, oh, well, cedar is is beneficial because that was the the wood of the cross or oh this herb is useful because it has three leaves and these three leaves are representing the trinity or herb gerard is useful because god allowed a saint to use it to cure gouts that kind of thing so it's just kind of interesting to see that things were either sort of assimilated into the narrative or pushed away from it and you can sort of differentiate between like the that which was allowed by catholicism and that which wasn't it's just a really really fascinating divide I think in a similar way, though, like the empirical thought at the time also played a role. So something where like in traditional folk magic may have had a folkloric meaning now based on observation that we would say, oh, well, like this happened when we did this thing. And so that's now the empirical reasoning behind why we would use it for a certain purpose rather than some, you know, folk tale that you might have heard that was passed down, you know, through family or tradition. And so it, it's kind of both, right? It was not only assimilation into into the Christian Christian framework and um, Catholic framework, but also utilizing more empirical thought to provide quote unquote evidence for why things maybe work outside of some kind of like folkloric or mystic reasoning. Okay, well I think we will end it there before we you know bore you any further. Hopefully you found it interesting. I know I had a lot of fun researching this episode. Welcome back. Lovely to have you. Thank you for coming back. We appreciate it. If you would like to follow us, you can find us on Instagram under Test Tubes and Cauldrons. We also have a Discord that we will put in the link um, in our YouTube videos below and also in the episode description if I remember, which hopefully I do. And you're welcome to join us there. We have lots of really interesting discussions. We talk about both science and the occult. I say pretty evenly. We go over papers and stuff and just like have a good time theorizing about everything. If you would like to join our community, please feel free to do so. And we will see you next week. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.